Welcome to CMM Off The Page, a podcast brought to you by CMM Magazine, a brand of Care Choices Limited. Guest speakers will equip listeners with take-home advice to support best practice in the social care sector. The podcast is available to listen to on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and to watch on the CMM website. We hope you enjoy this latest episode. Plan Day from Zero handles workforce management complexity so you don't have to. It handles your roster, your time tracking, your comms, your payroll data, and your reporting. Plan Day also improves compliance confidence from anywhere, anytime, and on any device. With the right people in the right place, small business has a big future. Plan Day, make your day work. We would like to inform our listeners that CMM recorded this episode before hearing the tragic news of school teacher Ruth Perry's death. Ruth Perry took her own life and her sister has said her death was a direct result of the process and outcome of an Ofsted inspection that saw the school's rating downgraded from outstanding to inadequate. Her family said an inspection at her school, Caversham Primary School in Reading, had turned her into an absolute shadow of herself. Our thoughts are with Ruth's family and her colleagues. This episode seeks to highlight how inspections can sometimes impact the well-being of the workforce in a professional setting. So yeah, thank you everyone for joining us today uh, for CMM Off The Page. It's our second podcast, uh, which we just launched. And today we will be focusing, uh, delving into the world of CQC inspections uh, with a particular focus on workforce morale uh, and well-being um, as well. So, you know, perhaps you didn't receive the outstanding rating that you're hoping for. Um, how did this impact the workforce morale? And I suppose what lessons can be learned um, moving forwards? I'm delighted to be joined by co-host Professor Martin Green, OBE. Uh, Martin is the Chief Executive of Care England, uh, the organisation representing smaller, medium-sized and large social care providers. Um, Martin will be sort of obviously sharing the latest government policy, looking at the regulator in the year ahead and, and sort of sharing insights from his members at Care England into how, into how the inspections are going. Um, Martin has been on our television screens frequently um, of late, holding the government to account about the chronic underfunding in the social care sector. Um, just last month, Martin told the BBC, I'm so old that I've heard so many government statements um, of promise, uh, a new start, a more integrated system, which never materializes. Um, so Martin has really heard it all before. Um, if only politicians could be as honest as Martin. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah I'm really excited to have Martin with us today um, so thank welcome Martin and thank you for joining us thank you very much I'm really looking forward to this podcast great fantastic and, and CMM off the page is provider-led of course so it's fantastic to welcome Shaw Healthcare uh, to the podcast today another Martin would you believe <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, Martin uh, Van Hinsberg did I get That's that right yeah wonderful <laughs> Wonderful. And Martin's the operations director in the South and East Midlands for Shore Healthcare. Um, and Shore Healthcare is the largest employee owned trust um, in the healthcare sector. So employee recognition being really at the, at the center and heart of the organization. So really looking forward to hearing from you, Martin, about how you really champion uh, workforce well-being um, in your organization. Absolutely. So, well, Thank you. Look forward to the podcast. Thank you. Great, welcome. Um, yeah, and, and, and finally, um, the podcast obviously have a particular focus on well-being. Um, so it's wonderful to have Sophie Corsard here, who, who's become representing Judgment Index. Um, Sophie's actually a regular contributor to CMM magazine as well. Um, and I'll let, I'll let Sophie sort of comment on Judgment Index and what you do, um, that you're a sort of values-based um, behaviour, um, sort of focusing on staff appraisals and also sort of building leadership. Um, within organisations in the care sector. So yeah, welcome Sophie. Thank you, looking forward to learning and sharing today. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Yeah, so obviously o over to you really. I mean, I thought maybe we could um, sort of start things off uh, with Professor Green. I'm going to use Professor Green, otherwise it might become very complicated. 
if that's okay with everyone. Um, yeah, so I mean, obviously, we're, you know, we're thinking about the CQC inspection process, we've been a lot of change. Um, we've obviously had COVID pandemic, which has obviously massively um, changed the way the regulator inspects. Um, so I'm interested, Martin, whether you think that the uh, inspection process is sort of fit for purpose in 2023, given the current challenges. Um, you know, is it fair and justified that, um, you know, if an organisation receives a low rating, if they're short staffed? Yeah, I mean, my view is that the regulatory process is not fit for purpose, and I think we need a root and branch reform. What I'd like to see is a much more, um, shall we say, forensic approach to regulation that does a forensic analysis of critical incidents in a very non-judgmental way, then gives clear messages to individual practitioners, to organisations and to the wider system. What I think we've got at the moment, sadly, is an inspection regime that tends to, first of all, start from the premise of let's try and find something wrong, and then tends to adopt a blame game approach. Now, I've seen this as well uh, in, in so many reports where they identify something is wrong in one service, and then, you know, two weeks later, you read a report about another service, and the same thing comes up. So clearly the regulatory system does not have a way to cascade clear messages to the entire sector about how they need to improve. And I think these are in a way the missed opportunities that regulation could give us to um, see it as a cornerstone of public protection, but also to see it as a way of improving the whole sector. And I don't think it does that at the moment. I think there are some serious in inequalities in the system as well, particularly about the way in which it's, it, the CQC treat the National Health Service as opposed to uh, independent care providers. And there are very much double standards at work here. And I think that's another thing that they need to really be focused on. How are they going to make inspection fair and, and equal across the system? And the third point I want to make is that, in my view, they have not clarified how they're going to do their role in oversight of commission. It seems to me that they don't know how they're going to do it. There seem to be very little enforcement powers that they'll be able to take on local authorities. They have not learned the lessons from previous regimes. And let's not forget that in the days of CSCI, they did have a role in monitoring commissioning. And I would say that um, I regarded Dame Denise Platt, the then chair of CSCI, and Sir David Behan, its chief executive, as fairly robust in their dealings with local authorities in the same way that they were robust in their dealings with care providers. But I did feel they were quite fair and balanced. And I'm not convinced that we see that fairness or balance in the current regime. So my view is we need some serious reform in the way in which the regulator works and the approach it takes. Thanks so much, um, Professor Green. And, and Martin, is that is that is that ringing true um, to you in terms of your current experiences? With oh, yeah, absolutely. I just had a, a few other things there from Martin is that, you know, we've had the uh, the direct monitoring approach through the, the pandemic situation. Um, we've come from we've come out of that now and um, CQC has gone missing, uh, in my opinion. Um, you know, we have a number of services that haven't been inspected for over two years, uh, yet we will get an invite to a direct monitoring of a home that's rated good and has been, you know, there's been no issues there whatsoever. Yet I have a number of services that are sitting on RI um, with a, an inspection that wasn't even owned by the current manager that's there. And yet I don't seem to be able to get CQC to come out and actually do an inspection, a proper inspection of those services. Now, I know we're going to move on to morale and uh, engagement and so on. Mm. I can think of nothing worse than a manager sitting in the service for two years that has worked their socks off with their team and wants to present to CQC just what they've done as they've been doing to the residents' families and to the business and to their staff. Uh, yet we don't seem to be able to get an inspection. But, you know, we've had a whole host of direct monitoring inspections. So where are they? Why are the inspectors not coming out? And actually, as Martin says, instead of coming out to find out what's wrong, come out to see the significant improvements that have been made in a number of services 
that there's just no justification for not being there. And I just don't feel that as a provider at the moment, we're getting the level of support and the quality of service that we would be held accountable for if we weren't delivering, is my view. Yeah, no, I no, I think that's absolutely true. I think they need to sort of, there seems to be a massive focus on, you know, the sort of requires improvement and, and inadequate, um, you know, instead of championing the, you know, yeah, all, all the good practice and the good work that's being done in the sector. Um, absolutely. Um, Professor Green, do you have something to add? Yeah, I think um, Martin's points are well made and it is increasingly difficult to get them to come out to services that have had sometimes, as you say, Martin, two years of being languishing in a particular category. The work has been done to improve them, but the CQC has not come to reinspect them. Now, as Martin says, that has enormous impacts on staff morale. It also has enormous impacts when people are looking for services. If they see that there is a requires improvement or an inadequate, then of course that puts them off engaging in that service. And the, 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 the reality is, that service may have been in that position two years ago, but as Martin says, because of the enormous amounts of work that members of staff uh, have put in, it's in a very different place. And what this does is it really has an impact on morale as well as an impact on how the service is perceived. It also is very, very difficult for families because they're all the time wondering, well, have these improvements that uh, people have said they're being made have been made? And they've got no independent validation of that. So I just think the CQC need to be really mindful of the impact of what their particular rating is. And I don't think they understand the impact it has on morale. I don't think they understand the impact it has on the ability to attract new residents to a particular service. Mm, yeah. So those issues are really important issues. I also have noted a tendency for them to, when they inspect, just inspecting one or two domains which don't change the rating, and that's really unhelpful. Um, and I think Martin's point about having been absent from the scene in a lot of these cases, they have been. I think because of COVID, they got used to doing stuff on their phones and on their computers, and they have not then returned to a business as usual approach. So that's another big challenge. They don't seem to be cognizant of some of the big issues affecting the sector. And particular irritation to me is they will tell members of my membership that they can't use the fact they can't get staff as an excuse for not doing anything and then the CQC use the same excuse we can't get staff so that's their line as this blanket for not coming out and doing inspections so I think you know the organization needs fundamental review I think there's a leadership issue in that organization as well the leaders of it are pretty under the radar at the moment and if they're going to go through this transition, we need to be seeing the chief inspector and the chief executive talking about what their vision for regulation is, how they're going to have an integrated approach, which enables regulation to be a catalyst for integrated outcomes for citizens. Yeah. And I don't see much conversation in that space going on. I think as well, you know, what we've had to do as a result of this is to, you know, support staff, support family members, support those people looking for admissions into the home by other sources. You know, mm. we've run all sorts of internal um, events to encourage people to come in and see the home for themselves. Come and do your own rating and your own review of what you see. Um, you know, we use a lot of the, uh, what I would call trip advisors of, uh, of care. We use carehomes.co.uk to engage with our residents' families to get positive outcomes and positive information so that we can try to support those people looking for care who are confused by a rating of two years ago. When they come in, they just don't see that. Um, mm. And it gives our managers an opportunity then to do what they should be doing with CQC and selling their service um, to these people that, that come in. You know, the, the first phone call is come and see what we do because our home is, is a lovely place to live, come and have lunch with the residents, come and enjoy the experience um, and this is the kind of route now that we're needing to take to encourage people to come and see our services as we're not able to offer them um, you know a, a good rating or an outstanding rating for the amazing work that I see going on 
day by day by services are not just the ones within my organization but i'm sure i'm talking on behalf of frustrations of other providers that are out there needing to find alternative solutions to sell their home as well as people googling what is the current rating of the home and Martin, so is there a particular example, so bringing it back to the workforce, and is there a particular inspection that you could share with us today in terms of what was the impact of that inspection and, yeah, and how you supported the, the, the workforce, um, in, I suppose, in the aftermath of that? Um, yeah, I mean, we can concentrate on the real negatives. I can think of a service that three years ago was rated inadequate and was not a well-run service. And we needed to invest significant time and systems and the way that we operated as a result of that. So as Martin said, we took a grassroots approach. We looked at how we could implement more systems across the group, but more importantly, how could we change the service? At its next inspection, it went from inadequate to requires improvement um, with uh, three areas still requiring imp improvement. Um, <clears throat> Uh, its most recent inspection, I was pleased to say that it moved to a good inspection, um, but it still had um, a requires improvement for well-led. And yet when I read the report, you know, there's glowing responses about how the manager leads the business, how staff morale and the whole ethos of the, the particular care home has improved, how staff and residents feel supported, how supervisions are completed, how... Um, new friends of the, the care home have come on board to support what goes on. Um, and I think there was a real disappointment that we were looking to achieve an outstanding. Mm -hmm. I was very disappointed to actually receive a, a requires improvement in well-led, which was the very reason why the service had moved from requires improvement to well-led, because it was well-led that we checked our governance system, we'd introduced risk registers, we'd introduced more audit systems and tools. We had a manager who was going full out with her team to gather evidence and support an outstanding inspection. And at the end of the day, yes, we were pleased with the good, but we wanted an outstanding. And we were very mm. disappointed that the very leader of that particular care home was devastated. As I, you, I'm sure you can appreciate with a... Mm another requires improvement work with well-led when there's a host of improvements that have been made and how, and, and how did you manage that martin how you know in the after that happened and communicate that i suppose to the wider team as yeah. well i uh, mean the the, the the team itself were happy because they received a good um which i wasn't particularly uh, pleased with because i really felt the home was an outstanding home the manager was devastated with the um obviously the the well-led element but more importantly I think what it did was with good communications it's actually spurred the home on again that we've had such significant feedback from residents families and support from our friends of groups um, that we've got all sorts of additional agendas on now we've got a rewilding project going on at that home we've created a wellness room um, we have events every weekend we've got a wellness calf we, you know, it, it's difficult to see what else we're going to do to underpin a really well-led service to try and get us that outstanding we need, or at very least a clean bill of greens across the board. So I think in some ways it's actually spurred on the home to say, well, you know, clearly what we've done isn't enough. So we're going to just absolutely going to need to try and blow your socks off because we just don't know any other way that we're going to be able to get this message across to you. Um, and I feel sorry on occasions for the manager and the staff who invest so much time, you know, they really mm -hmm. put so much effort into what they do. Um, and yet I think a, a quick checklist, a run through someone's opinion. Um, and actually, I get frustrated with, um, you know, the, the actual um, level of quality of inspection that goes on and that we justify things around maybe one mistake in a hundred care plans or you know where is the ratio of what does that actually mean um when the care home report comes out and says but we found no evidence of any risk to residents and families were happy yet i see no outstanding i see no change to good as a result of those comments so i get frustrated um but what it does is it spurs us on you know, we communicate mm. that, that to our staff um 
So yeah, I, I suppose is, is that spurring or is being able to keep that momentum, isn't it? And, and that enthusiasm within the workforce when I suppose, like you said there, uh, Martin, you're, you're doing everything that you possibly can. Um, you know, it's like a bit of an uphill struggle at times, I imagine. It does feel like that, but we just have to galvanize, you know, what we do. Um, we have to look back at our processes again. Um, we regularly review actions in the home because that's also a lessons learned for everybody is that you've had an inspection you need that service improvement plan to be ongoing um, you don't need multiple plans all over the place that nobody can actually work with you need one service improvement plan with all of your actions on there so that you can regularly track those improvements so I mean what we're trying to do is build so much evidence now that you can't find a fault or if there is one we can we can justify you know what we've done to improve that uh, where we've been where we've come from to try and improve our racing and we oversee all of that with an independent review from our quality team that comes in and measures the home against our uh, at the Chloe's to make sure that we're prepared and that we feel that you know our, our rating score is 90 95 percent on our rating our audits are up our risk register shows where we need to be pointing um, the work that needs to be done across the regions. So, you know, it's difficult to understand how we can fail on that. So it belts, braces, communication, support, working within the, across the whole of the company to just try and make sure we've got a joined up effort. And mm. the last thing I would say is, you know, the staff on the day of an inspection are critical to a good inspection result. You know, if you've got a positive team that understand the, the difficulties and the problems, um, but also are immensely proud of their work and what they've achieved, um, you're on to a winner. Absolutely. Uh, and involvement from families and friends and all that level of support. Um, I fail to see how CQC can't recognise the improvements in the homes that that not only our company, but others are demonstrating on the mm. basis. Yeah, no, fantastic. It sounds like you really are um, doing absolutely everything possible uh, leading up to those inspections, Martin. And I really want to bring Sophie in. Um, she's patiently been uh, <laughs> wasting her moment. Um, so, uh, Sophie, you might want to just give a little bit of background for our listeners on Judgment Index and sort of the organisation yeah. that you that you work for sure yeah we've got we've got two sides to the business really so we have the judgment index assessment which measure, measures value-based behaviors so our care clients use that as part of their recruitment onboarding um, appraisal process um, and we do a lot of research with our clients as well which might be relevant for me to mention one or two findings um, because certainly one of the key things that we find within this sector is that there is a struggle with self-esteem and confidence um, and self-criticism so I think that's going to really play into some of the conversations that we're having today um, when you do have a workforce who are naturally quite tough on themselves um, you know they have high standards they want to achieve them um, and then they feel this disappointment and this um, you know just just frustration I guess when when they don't get the accolade that they may feel they deserve with with their ratings um, and then the other side to our business is we run a lot of kind of leadership culture workshops so I can definitely definitely share a few kind of strategies for any management who are going through this right now who are finding that you know they haven't had the result that they expected how do they manage the team morale um, how do they sort of stop the culture from from shifting into sort of a downward spiral um but i just you know listening to martin talking then you know you can't help but your heart goes out to these people that let's face it this is not a sector like the financial services as an example where you know there is heavy regulation and that's that's a huge part of the job within the care sector there is heavy regulation and then there is also this heart this caring side that people have um you know and they really do want the best for their clients their residents and they're working so hard to evidence and prove that for cqc to then not get the rating um that they wanted and i, I just can't imagine how that manager must have felt martin because as you said the, the evidence was there that all the other services aspects of the service had improved so why was well led the one that that didn't show that um and I imagine that that must have been really tough 
for that manager as much as they probably wanted to celebrate with their team the improvement there would have been that feeling deep down inside of well, well why didn't I get recognized for the work that I've done um so yeah it's 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 a it's a tough one and, and hopefully um yeah, I don't know if you want me to, to share yeah, a little bit yeah, right now. Yeah, or... absolutely. Yeah, no, definitely, Sophie. I think it'll be interesting if we can touch on the, uh, I think you wrote actually in the CMM magazine article around the self-esteem and building confidence. And I wondered how thinking about this particular scenario of, of that post inspection and sort of that feedback um, with, the, with the whole wider workforce, um, what can providers do to really, you know, support them at their, their yeah. workforce at the time? I think, yeah, and I think that's key. So I think something that that happens a lot, um, and you see it with with all types of businesses, is that the focus goes to what the result was, um, rather than the overall performance. So what you find is that you know you get that result. Um, if it's an improvement, then yes, let's celebrate. If it's um, you know if it's disappointing, then the focus is then on the result and potentially who to blame for that result, um, and that can really start to been a culture within a home particularly um, a service that has been working towards let's say an outstanding rating and then doesn't get it um, you know you, you can really start to see that I, I always call it a spiral start to spin down so you find that yeah are we going to blame the CQC or are we going to blame someone within the team that did something wrong on the day or somebody who hasn't evidenced this correctly or, or the manager or the deputy um, and I think that there needs to be a space for emotions to come out and it sounds like martin you know let that manager um vent their frustration and they're upset and, and you definitely need to do that if anybody's familiar with uh 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 steve peter uh, steve peterson was saying that the chimp paradox this is the chimp you know the raw emotion that you need to get to get out um but after that there needs to be a focus on not just the result but what was the performance? Um, and I think a really good way to do that is to gather the team together and think about, OK, so how were we in terms of preparation? How were we in terms of clinical? How were our care plans? How were we on the day? And, and actually start to review all of these aspects in isolation and then look at the areas and, and Martin used the word action quite a lot. Where are the action points off the back of that? Because if you only focus on the result, um, then that's either going to be a, a great feeling or a, a sad feeling. Um, but really, it needs to be on the performance. And if you feel that your performance was as good that it deserved that outstanding rating, then at least you can hold on to that. These are the things that we should take forward, that we should capitalize on. And these are the things that we can look to to improve for next time. Um, the most difficult part of, of doing that review is taking the emotion out in order to do it. Um, you know, when people are in a space where they feel like they do want to blame or, um, you know, just get really frustrated, it can be very hard to sort of have that, let's say, critical constructive critical lens where you can step away from the situation and almost instead of you being in it and saying how how you did looking at it as if you are watching a video uh, you know taking yourself away from the situation in order to assess it properly um, and that's something that a manager may struggle with let alone the rest of the team but but that would be the key there brilliant thanks so much Sophie and yeah, that was really good really good insight I know also you talk a lot about self developing self leaders um, with, within within a, within the workforce as well, but we can we can touch on that. I just want to bring in um, Professor Green um, now. In terms of the government and um, sort of workforce support in terms of well-being, I didn't know if there's any updates that you'd like to share with our listeners today. Um, well, I think that part of the problem is the government does not have a very comprehensive strategy on workforce, and certainly there's no strategy on workforce in social care. So they spend a lot of time and energy on the NHS. They talk endlessly about integration, but we don't see the strategies that go on in the NHS being rolled across social care. I think it's also important to remind people that this issue of morale is absolutely central to the quality of care that's given. If people are suffering low morale, if they're not having their, their, their work recognised, this can have a big impact on them and how they feel about their work. I was also very interested in a point Martin made, which is another challenge that we all face. So the 
outstanding or not outstanding rating, they then look at the details of the report. So how can somebody who all the things that were said in that report about the leadership in that service and the service has gone from an inadequate to a good and it's done that under somebody's leadership. There have been really clear evidence in the report of good leadership and then it comes out as requires improvement. And this is one of the other things. So even if you were able to look at the report and say to a leader, well, they identified this, this and this as being the challenge, that would be more logical and it's a much better conversation. But when you see a report and it shows really positive comments about leadership and then you see a rating that's completely at variance to that, this is a real challenge for uh, providers and, and for staff. I think the government approach needs to be much more systematic and I do think the government need to think about the impact various things are having on morale and the ability of the sector to cope post-COVID. So they need to think about a workforce strategy. They need to think how they ensure well-being within uh, organisations. They need to think about the impact that uh, CQC ratings having on people. They need to understand the issues about funding. They need also to understand that we as a sector need to have much more money to be able to train and support people and also to give people time to reflect. It was really interesting, Sophie, what you said about um, needing to have that time to take a step back, to look at things and to systematically say, well, how are we going to analyze this inspection in a non-judgmental way? Well, of course, some of that requires people to have the time and the space to do it. And yet government always is looking at how they commission care on the basis of just the lowest level they can get away with. So, for example, in home care services, you have a situation where people are not even being paid for the time between visits, let alone for the time to come together and reflect on things like an inspection report. What were the issues? How can we improve things? How can we validate each other for the stuff we did well? How can we challenge when we think that assessment is unfair? There's no structural approach to that in the system and the government hasn't got a really clear way of saying this needs to be part of a system that's built around quality and respect staff for the amazing work they do, the contribution they make. So even little things like, um, I endlessly see government ministers on television telling us how fabulous the staff in the NHS are, but very seldom do I see them talking about social care staff. We saw a bit of it during COVID, but it's now gone away. We also see it in the media. So the media doesn't understand or recognise social care. If I look at my television box on a particular evening, I saw inside the ambulance, GPs behind closed doors, Emma Willits delivers babies, uh, the, the day surgery unit, um, you know, the list was endless and they were all documentaries and the documentaries had a current theme, which was the staff are wonderful. And whenever there's a problem, it's somebody else's problem. It's never the staff. Well, we don't have that in social care. What we have is a media and politics who immediately, if anything goes wrong, they don't rush to either forensic analysis of why they rush to blame. And so I think that creates real problems in terms of staff morale. Uh, so what we need is some clear, systematic approaches from government that recognises social care as an integral part of a health and social care system. We need to be seen as important in the same way that staff are in the NHS. We need to have support in terms of training and development budgets. And I think people will be astounded to know that the NHS spends £100,000 a minute on training. That's every minute of every day. And yet that money is not available to social care. Now, in an integrated system, it would be. The status of staff needs to be validated by all bits of government. So I want to see ministers talking about how great staff in health and social care are. I want to see good examples of social care being championed in the media. And we don't really often see that. Whenever we have media attention, it's usually about something when it's gone wrong. Yeah, um, definitely. There are some big issues there, but it does require some really clear leadership at government level. And I don't think we're getting that.
Yeah, no, I think leadership and yeah, and also understanding, <laughs> like you mentioned um, as well. Yeah, to really understand uh, the role of of a, of a care worker. Martin, your, Sorry. your comment on on budget as well. I mean, we've um, we've gone through a program. We've gone. We recognise the um, the requirement to build strong leaders for the future within our services, and we've created our own leadership program um, within Sure, and I'm sure other providers have similar. Where you know we've invested significant amounts of money and time in taking our deputy managers of the managers of the future and our managers to invite them to a you know a, an ongoing leadership program over a set bunch of modules to really upskill everybody to the same level of leadership quality within our services so that whether you're a deputy in the north or a deputy in the south or a manager in the north you're armed with the same level of information that enables you to do your job on a day-to-day -day basis now that's come at some cost i mean taking those people out of the service for one uh, developing the programs for two um and actually it's not you don't even end up with a you know a qualification at the end of that but to be quite honest when you look at the content and the quality that's been developed in house to bring those people along it's am it's absolutely amazing and you know that that is essential that leadership program we now realize is is essential for the future leadership of our business um you touched on the wonderful job that staff do. I'm humbled when I go to staff appreciation days and long service events, which we have on a regular basis. Yeah, I, I was actually going to mention those, Martin. I was looking at your website yesterday and the all of the, the news stories there, so many. And I think it's just testament clearly how long the, the workforce is staying with you. <laughs> well, I, I, I sit there and, you know, it's announced that today we've got people here with over, you know, we've got 350 uh, years of long service in this home today and it's like people have been there for 30 years working in amongst what they do and I'm just absolutely humbled by that and it's really important that it's recognized um, it, it encourages the new starters to come along and say I can really make a career out of social care I can see that um, and it's really important that we and I'm sure Sophie will touch on this that you know we do praise and we do thank people for what they do and you know a box of chocolates a bottle of wine some flowers a certificate as we did through covid to say wow guys you know thank you for all you did we didn't need a particular clap at eight o'clock on a tuesday we just wanted to say thank you you've been amazing and of course we are also lucky that with our employee owned trust um, that we're able to bonus pay our staff for um, success in the business. So as we do create success, we share the benefits of that within our employee owned trust, which has been a real significant boost to morale within the staffing team as well. But just to come back, Martin, I think, uh, you know, the, the significance of more money to spend on training, budgets, equipment um, to actually help develop those programmes. And it also supports the, the very things that we know we've got shortages on in nurse practitioner roles, uh, uh, med technicians, um, to support that blue thin line of nurses that we've got that are trying to hold things together from us from a clinical point of view. It will enable us the opportunity to develop that support network and bring along that next set of nurses and clinicians that want to come into social care, come and work with us. Absolutely. And, um, you know, we cannot underestimate, as you say, Martin, the value of really thanking people and taking time to just say we absolutely appreciate you. <clears throat> that is so important. No, no, it certainly, certainly goes a long way, I think. Um, I'm just going to bring Sophie in because, Sophie, you mentioned about self-criticism earlier and, and how the care workforce, you know, something that, you know, people do struggle with. And I wondered if you had some some thoughts to, to share on that yeah and I think I think it ties in really well actually with the the conversation because it, it, I think it would be good for for companies to sometimes sit down and do a, a sort of internal audit and say well how are we recognizing staff and how are we are we doing the little things that make the biggest difference so a phone call from an area manager to say you know that was great I've heard about this great thing that you've done to a, to a member of staff um, and I think a lot of care companies you know sometimes they get a bit nervous about some of these rewards and recognition schemes because they feel like it might might single someone out when somebody else has also done a good job but uh, but 
the importance of, of a simple thank you or a box of chocolates or a bottle of wine, um, you know, don't underestimate how powerful that is. Um, yes, so our research has found that, that self-criticism levels within this sector are particularly high when compared to other sectors. And I think, I think there is a, a few reasons behind this. I think, um, you know, this is a sector where you are constantly looking for, well, what's wrong? What's the risk? What's the safe potential safeguarding issue, et cetera. So when your mindset is constantly going towards, let's say a, a negative or a potential negative, um, it can be very hard to then focus on the positive. Um, so for managers or team leaders or anybody working in this care environment, you know, when you gather around for a quick meeting or whatever it might be, listen to the conversations that are happening and it will be, oh, we need to watch out for this or, you know, this is potentially not good, you know, without me giving sort of specific scenarios. And how often is it, oh, and this happened today, which was a real success and this has happened for this resident and or this person has stepped up today um, to take a leadership role because somebody else wasn't here and this is what they've achieved. Um, and try and sort of balance out what I call the, the negative with the positive. Um, and what you'll find is that will then start to build more of a culture of people who are prepared to recognize themselves for the great things that they've done as well. Because mm. I, I don't know, maybe this is a Brit thing, but we're often very nervous <laughs> to say, hey, I did a great job today. I did this successfully. Yeah, um, you know, so maybe bringing in some of that kind of US pat yeah. on the back. <laughs> Sophie, how, how often do you hear? I mean, I, I used to hear this. I hear it far less now where I get, you know, well, I'm just a cleaner. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just a cook. No, you're not. You're an important cog in the wheel of what we do. And to take the actual time, you know, if our CEO comes into the home, it's not, oh, the CEO's here, quick, let's tidy up and make sure everything's how it needs to be. Actually, what he will do is he'll go around and he'll find that cleaner and say, wow, this home is spotless. Fantastic job. Um, you know, I'm the CEO. Pleased to meet you. I'm really encouraged by what I've seen. Have you got any ideas about how we can improve things, what we can do? That's the kind of thing that, that we need to be doing to build that self-esteem within the team. And walking the floor is a really important part of that. Just good morning. Good evening. How's your day going? Particularly with those resources that we're trying to retain within the business. You know, a support worker, um, a cook. Uh, a cleaner these are key people in what we do outside of the leadership team in running that home on a day-to-day -day basis and retention is absolutely critical to our success and you know we need to do more of that in the service um you know my tip for my ops managers and myself is to be far more available when you go in the home go and see people go and find the cook what are we doing for lunch today? Oh, my fantastic spaghetti bolognese. I absolutely <laughs> love that. What sources have you used? Engage with them. Show an interest. And I think that really brings in that kind of, you know what? I do do a good job here. I am important. I am. Important. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's having that place, isn't it? It's feeling valued. Yeah. It's feeling part of a part yeah, of the team. Uh, and also, and, and probably more for the decision makers. They, they find out things that they probably wouldn't find out in a, in a board meeting um and then they Absolutely. have you know th those you know, those those good insights that they can then share with the wider team um that absolutely and master and professor green um <laughs> i was just getting used to that um i thought it'd be nice for some forecasts i'm conscious of time as well i've you're all extremely busy people um some forecast maybe just looking ahead obviously you know nearish at the beginning of the year but for the regulator this year advice for providers now who are maybe preparing for an inspection with the regulator or sort of yeah might be um so any sort of advice from you yeah i mean i think that things that both sophie and martin have said which is about being really confident in the service that you provide being very clear about when you are communicating that how you communicate it also using some very clear evidence bases so you know making sure that when you get those really great comments from people who use services or their families they're recorded um, try and create the most open culture you can so that you're trying to say to people well look at this service from the perspective of what it would be like for you if you were a resident here or a family member or 
asking people, well, what do you think the things that we do are really good? And what things do you think we should improve? Um, you know, being really open, as Martin said, about going in and talking to everybody. There is a tendency, if you're not careful, to go in and talk to a particular group, usually the managers. Well, actually, it's really important to engage with everybody. And one of the best parts of my job is that I make sure I go out to care services as often as possible. And I love talking to the staff in the kitchens. I love talking to residents, to families, to people who are carers, because they give you really valuable insights. Ask some really very baseline questions, which is to ask staff, would you like to live here? And what do you think we could improve? Because one of the things that's really important to remember is that nobody has the monopoly on good ideas. And so the more you include everybody in your team, including your residents and their families, to think about how we can improve the service if it needs improving, but also how we can champion the brilliant things that we do. And you know, Martin, the work that you do around some of your recognition and reward uh, events, really that really shines a light on good practice. It makes everybody feel part of a team. Everybody knows that they're all working to the same end, which is a good quality life for the people they support. And also so often, and it comes to something you said, Sophie, about, you know, staff are quite critical of themselves. And also what they tend to do is they take what they do as being just the norm and they don't realize what a transformational effect it has on people's lives. Absolutely. Things like, you know, I'm only a care worker or I'm only a, a domestic. Well, actually, if it wasn't for you, there would be people who would be living very, very enclosed lives and you've given them the opportunity to live well uh, and just constantly reminding people of that. And also in cre creating an atmosphere where people are really happy to give feedback, whether good it or, or improve, you know, these are the things you're good at, these are the things you need to improve. Encouraging that open culture is so, so important, I think. Um, so I would say those are the things to go to an inspection with. And also, though, to remind yourself that you can challenge things when an inspector says, we don't think this. Give the evidence to the contrary. Be confident in your services. And that's really important. But it does require you to work as a team in that because it can be quite intimidating when somebody shows up and says, I'm an inspector. You know, we all suffer that. Yeah. And yeah, not, not being afraid to have those conversations and to, and to be as transparent as possible, um, I would imagine. But I think if, if there is that preparation with the workforce before the inspector arrives and you, you sort of, you know, you can kind of obviously get ahead of yourself a little bit and, and prepare and almost prepare mentally as well, which I think is important, not just for the inspection itself, um, but that it should, might help stuff. It should almost be a real positive experience to have an inspection, really. Mm. I mean, instead of it being, oh my God, see, you see you here quick, we need to, it should be, it should be a real positive opportunity. It's, Oh, hooray, CQC are here. Let's now blow their socks off and show them what we can do. You know, come and look in my kitchen. Come and look at my cleaning cupboard. Come and look at my care records. Look at my history. Look, <laughs> look at what our activities are doing today. Look at all these events that we've had. Look at my pictures. Look at my how clean the home is. Look at our infection control records. Mm, you know, I think it should be it, much more of an enjoyable experience. Mm, right? Yeah, I think I think I think that's where language I think that's where language comes into play, isn't it? If it was, you know, awards, um, I think the you know the use of the word inspection is I think that's how yeah, I think language plays quite a big role in that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Sophie, did you have any any final thoughts? I thought of a story, actually, and I was running it through my head just thinking, how can I not butcher this story now while I retell it? <laughs> but, but, but sparked by, by what we've been discussing today is that um, there is a story that when the US was in competition with, with Russia for the uh, man on the moon for this, the space race, um, the president went out to one of the sites and he was, you know, walking around doing an inspection as they obviously prepared to launch a rocket. Um, and as he walked through the corridor, there was the lady cleaning the floor um you know mopping the floor and he said oh you know hello mom um what, what do you do here and she said me I'm helping to put a man on the moon so she wasn't just a cleaner she wasn't just a care worker she was contributing um to this mission that the entire team were on and I think you know every time I hear that story it just 
sort of warms my heart that 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 she had that com that confidence and that belief that she was contributing. Um, so I think that's something that we do need to instill in the teams. Um, you know, good result, bad result, indifferent result, focused on the the clarity of the performance that that the team are giving together. So. Um, yeah, that's my, that's yeah. my final thought. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was really good. I was like visualised it and everything. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> great storyteller. Um, yeah, thank you so much to all of our all of our speakers today. Um, Martin from Shaw Healthcare, Professor Martin Green from Care England, and Sophie Coulthard from Judgment Index. Really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to CMM Off The Page. Explore CMM's portfolio of content, including daily news, blogs, a magazine, and CMM Insight webinars by visiting www.caremanagementmatters.co.uk. To make sure you don't miss a podcast, follow CMM on Twitter at CMM underscore magazine and use the hashtag CMM Off The Page to join the conversation and share your feedback. See you next time. CMM Off The Page. Listen, learn, lead.